is new in itself. So yeah, no, I, for me, the, the the programming would be the the hardest of the parts. So so yeah, we had that the fundamental probe part was okay. Um, we use the team aside. The calculator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, That's so now it's doing it. <laughs> now, now it's doing what I want it to do. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then I looked this week, and I, this time I'm like, oh gosh, now we've got chemistry. So yes, <laughs> the previous year. The, you know, yes. The so I will talk about the chemistry for sure. Um, and I guess it's going to be clear in my brain. I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Um, <laughs> this is the first time I've done the detector thing. I did sound of music last time. We're not doing sound of music. This is this is something totally different. So you know, we always like being the coaches, and we can oh, have switch. Yeah, and I mean, okay. the should be out from South Africa, and we do not need that. I didn't to know that. <laughs> so I did programming, and I, I worked with programming. So that is the closest I get to anything science. -y. So everything. Well, but this one is important. So yes. So everything fun. is me learning. I mean, now I can watch Jeopardy and you know, <laughs> machines. I can run a category. You know. <laughs> but it's all good. The kids will think you learn. I'm not joking when I say I don't know anything. You right. Know because that. you're a teacher. You know everything, there's, right? There's, there's, In all the things. <laughs> You get this. Please make it happen. <laughs> well, I got a couple of minutes, and we'll give people some time to arrive from downstairs. Uh, just wherever you can see the screen, I do have some some physical things and visual aids that we can pass around the room in a little bit, but. Right now, just wherever is comfortable, and you can see the screen. Are we going to have access to these slideshows, right? So yes. Yeah, right now you'll see. You don't have to take notes if you want to take notes. By all means, I'm not going to stop. I like you. your name. And your yeah, email name, address. division, okay. email address. Um, <laughs> yeah. So in the, in the process of putting this together, I will say, I kind of did it all this week. I had started it before, and then as I was reading the rules, I realized that the sensor they were building is different than all of the existing stuff that's online. So I was like, oh, cool. So I have to start all over. Well, I'm good. You see, that's what I needed you to do. <laughs> that's, right. that's what I'm here for, is to hopefully fall into all of those pitfalls before you guys do. And show you some of the things where I was like, hey, this is a total dead end. Thank you. That, is, that is what I was hoping for. I think the word is coming to you. Well, I will show you where all the dead ends are. Now, um, I know you said you had a team that did it before. Yeah, I think And they used the calculator as their data collection device. What about you? This is my first year of doing this. Nice. Oh, all, all together. Well, let me tell you what my team has done before. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Right. I think it's the hardest to get, just saying, and I've been coaching forever. Right? It's like, this to me is yeah, this is mind blowing a little bit. This is hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not going to lie. I was looking at this yeah. and I was like, okay, this won't be too bad. I'm like, oh, 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 oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, think, um, I think, I mean, having coached so many different events or this would be very, very challenging. And we'll talk about why it's going to be challenging in two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes. So you've done so you've done stuff, you've done nothing, and how about you? But if, have you done this before? It's one of the things that we're gonna just skip it ahead to slide number three. No. Not nice. Okay. You all they all don't know the pain they're going to go through. <laughs> As I said, it's a challenging event. Are you guys ready? Yeah. More or less? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, this is today. This is where we are. Uh, so, all right. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me. Obviously, I work here at uh, UT. 
Um, I technically don't do any research now because I'm a lecturer and the advanced lab director. So I put together all of the upper level labs and I run the instrumentation center. Uh, I am an analytical chemist, so think lasers and math, not beakers and glass. <laughs> I would be perfectly at home doing the optics event that yeah. they did. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll let that stuff. So I spent a lot of time on a laser table, left on mixing things together. Um, I've done these for quite some time. Uh, I volunteered because I did this last year, this last month. I did sound music, uh, which was very different. Did that with uh, little middle schoolers, and that was fun. So uh, like I said, I've been doing this for a year. I've been doing the teaching part for longer. Uh, my research has involved things like vibrational spectroscopy and nanotechnology and hemometric analysis. So uh, my job is basically to develop new tools and instrumentation and materials to detect, analyze, quantify. Um, those guys are little nanoparticles that are optical sensors that we built so that you can see inside of a cell. So about 60 nanometers thick. Uh, they give us a little optical probe. Uh, there's some advantages to why you'd want to use a nanomaterial versus a fluorescent dye. We don't need to worry about that. So I already engaged with you guys and I found out where you are at. Um, so yay, your coaches! Thank you for doing stuff with us. Um, it is a lot of fun, but a lot of work. Oh yes. Oh yes. So uh, as I was saying before that uh, I went through the rules several times and I tried to figure out things that uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of highlight where I found pitfalls. The rules are obviously all online. Um, it's going to be a team of up to two students. You can send one or two. You can't send three. Do you need eye protection according to the rules? Yes. Uh, you need class C indirect event or slash goggles. So these goggles, little things on here. Yes. These goggles, no. Uh, just plain safety goggles or glasses, also a no. Um, it's not an impound, you got 50 minutes, but that's not the device testing time. So uh, what's going to happen is you'll come in and they'll be taking a written test and groups will be called up to actually test their device. So this is a hybrid event for high school students. Uh, just some of the event parameters. Uh, you can bring a uh, ORP or Redox Pro with a laptop or calculator for programming and display, two standalone calculators of any type. Now, I do not know, and it is unclear as to whether or not that would mean you could bring three calculators for some reason, one to run a device and then you could do that one. Um, it, I, don't, I, don't I don't see why anybody would want to do that and bring three, but sure. Um, I guess you can. So yeah, you can have two standalone yeah. separate calculator. Uh, a, a three ring binder, um, two, one two inch or smaller three ring binder containing information in any form from any source. Great, so if you want to use that, that you can do that, right? <laughs> Not for information they bring in, no. <laughs> Sheet protectors, laminations, tabs, labels, all Basically, you get a binder and you can put whatever you like in the binder. Event supervisors are going to be going to supply some water and then some salt water samples ranging between 0 and 5 ppm in souffle cups. And we give you the dimensions on those so that you can practice how big does your probe need to be, or rather, how small does it need to be. Uh, region competition is going to be free. We're going to do four. Uh, you're going to have to answer questions about design, construction, programming, and operation uh, in line with the uh, building policy. All right. The devices have to be built using a microcontroller or microcontroller board. So you need to get analog data into some sort of digital form, right? So that's your A to D converter, analog to digital converter, some sort of board or device, right? So the TI Innovator, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, Microbit, which is why I do not have an actual pro built for you guys, because there's like lots of different ways to do this. Right? There's lots of different ones out there. Um, what did you do? We use a TI. We use a TI. Um, 
that the first guy. That is probably like, from what I the looking at. Yeah. The easiest is going to be the easiest for the students because there is already a bunch of stuff on the PI website and some tutorials to help them guide the, the programming. Um, Arduino might be a little bit easier or Raspberry Pi in terms of what like, I found some people to do it online. I'm going to chunk it in there. Um, you're going to build a sensor probe. It's going to produce a voltage, which varies according to the concentration of the salt solution. Um, you can connect that to a laptop and or a calculator. So there are going to be three basic parts to this, right? There's going to be the probe that does the actual sensing part. There's going to be a microcontroller, which they buy. And then there's that's going to take your analog signal and convert it into something that the computer that, or the calculator will then be able to then display the information on. So they got to get a read in. I think in the past they did temperature uh, and they did conductivity. Right, so if I wanted to measure PPMs of saline, I would probably just make a conductivity probe like we did last time. All of the information that you're going to find is either going to be for the temperature sensor or for this conductivity probe. Conductivity probe is a lot easier to make. All right, so it's a next level up. So um, Wi-Fi or internet connection is not allowed. The sensor has to be student constructed with a salt bridge from fundamental electronic components. Right, so you can't just go out and buy yourself a probe. They sell ORP probes, but are these combination probes? It's a lot like a. Oh, we don't have one. Ah, that's a lot like a pH electrode, right? It'll come in one body, and it's actually there are two collinear coaxial uh, sensors in here. Make sure this is a pH probe. Yeah, pH probe. All right, so you can buy something. Don't buy it. They gotta make it. Right. So the heart of this competition is really two parts. Like two parts. One is can they build this probe, and the other is can they do the programming to run it, which is why it can't just all be analog. Right. Because if I were a student and I was measuring this, I would have an analog meter that measures my voltage, and then just read the voltage I would write. You know, and PPM. Yeah. They have to have some sort of digital display that makes that reading for them. We'll talk about how they're going to do that. Sorry, right, right. yeah. yep. there were three components of this, and I wrote down the microcontroller. Okay, the microcontroller. The sensor that they build. And the sensor. And then the computer or calculator, which then displays that display. information and gives them the reading. The computer or calculator is also going to light up the LEDs over a certain range. To be specified, so um, you know, and they will they will not know what the range is until they get there. So it's going to be light up a red one between zero and a hundred. Light up light up the blue one between one hundred and one and a thousand. And they won't know exactly what those ranges are or what the colors are until they get there. So we're going to have to be able to modify that code the day of. Okay. And do they get? Do they will have some time to do that, obviously. But <laughs> good. Um, but but no, do they have? Does the stuff that we do, like does our display, have to have? Have to have a red, a green, a blue LED light? Yep. Yeah, it's going to have to have three. It's going to have to okay. light up three LEDs. Okay. Over a specific range, and then it's also going to have to give you a number in units of PPM. Okay. All right, so that's that exact range over which those lights light up. They don't know that going into it. It could be anything. So that's where they're going to have to say for this output range, we'll light up this LED. All right, so. That little microcontroller is going to be doing two parts. One is going to be collecting input from the probe, passing it to the computer or the calculator. The calculator is then going to get a number based on that voltage and then light up one of the three LEDs. So um, let's talk about that probe in itself. Part B is going to really be the hard part for most of them. Um, or the building the computer 
program would be the hard part for me, <laughs> but for, I think for the students, it's really going to be building this probe and getting it to work. Um, if you were at the, if you were there at the airplane one, and they were talking about build a backup, have them build more than one probe. Right? And that's going to be extra important for this year versus the temperature probe or the conductivity probe. It's really hard to break the conductivity probe or a temperature probe. They'll find a way to do it, but this one we got to worry about like, is are the contacts going to be clean? But like, is it going to be, um, you know, degraded as we use this probe? So it's going to be a little bit trickier in terms of keeping something fresh and stable. And so our device robustness is just not going to be there in the same way as it was before. Um, and just it's going to have a backup because if they drop it, they it's like, oh, we're done, right? So um, you can't have a printed circuit board, which kind of seems silly. Like if you're, I'm not making the rules, but like if you're going to let them use a some sort of Arduino or a PI innovator thing, why not? If they've got to go through and like find design a printed circuit board, yeah. but seems like a lot will work, but they can't do it. So they can't get the printed circuit board except for the digital display. So if you want to have it make a, have them like run a little digital display separately, that's fine. Um, they can't have um, an integrated daughter board, so you can't have something else that is basically running or driving the sensor in addition. So you're only going to have those three components, right? Pro, the microcontroller, computer, or calculator. Because you can buy little kits for the Arduino that will then run a probe and kind of do all the math and the programming for you uh, as a shortcut. Uh, you don't want to do that. All right. Um, sensor cables again have to be a minimum of 30 centimeters in length. So it's got to be about 30 centimeters long. Um, and it's got to fit through that seven centimeter diameter opening. Uh, suggestions for building an ORP sensor can be found at the SOINC.org website. And no, no, they are not. There are not plans there now. I do not know when plans will be on there. Quite late, yeah, so I, I looked there in there. So I'm going to do my best to show you how you would do that. And other construction parameters, you can use any code libraries for calibration from the device. Uh, as far as I can tell, that needs to be um, original code in there, but they can pull out modules from the code. I'm not a coder, so to me, it's like how much of that has to be original. I mean, they've got, they can't just like, go out and copy last year's stuff from online and then paste it and then put your name on the top. Right? But they can have, here is an Arduino code that will do um, a mathematical function. That's, at least that's how I kind of am reading this tool. The device has to have a digital display that clearly shows the voltage and salt concentrations in PPM to the nearest unit value. Um, this can be displayed on a laptop or calculator. Honestly, that sounds a lot easier than trying to run a separate display board. If the team chooses to use laptop or display board purposes, it cannot be used for the written test. Uh, the device must also be able to indicate a specific concentration range, generally using three separate LEDs red, green, and blue. Now, if you want to read a multicolor LED just because it would look cooler, um, it only has to be wired for one color. You cannot have one LED doing red, and then later on it does three. So three separate LEDs. Why? Uh, no. so, um, the exact concentration range for each zone will not be revealed until uh, enter and compete, and may be different for different locations. Um, we may require more than one color to be displayed at the same time. So maybe the range between 50 and 100 is both red and green. Teams cannot use electrical outlets during the competition, so you got to have this guy battery powered. Um, if it's not powered by a connected laptop or calculator, the device has to be powered by commercially available batteries, not exceeding 12 volts. And we're probably not going to run around and start testing them with like our hand meter or anything, or volt meter. But if you bring in something like a car battery, we're probably going to be like, oh, come on now. So um, no more than 12 volts. Stick a bunch of nine volt batteries together, we're going to be 
like probably not going to be uh, <laughs> probably not going to meet that rule. That is for two reasons. Uh, one is prim primarily it's just safety, um, not so much electrical hazard. But you might start generating oxygen and hydrogen gas in your saline solution. Uh, you're going to have to have a design log. The design log is a big part of the score for this event. So it's going to have to have these eight things, uh, top-down photograph, diagram, or picture, uh, with the school name labeled on the device, two, a data table with at least 10 trials. So make sure that they test it 10 times. So it's not to say it's successful, it just says 10. <laughs> Voltage, time, et cetera, versus the corresponding DPM. If multiple fixed resistors are tried, included data and graphs for all the potential resistors. That looks like language that is left over from when they did the temperature probe when they're making a voltage divider. I still need to make a voltage divider uh, to just kind of split out voltage. We'll talk about that if we need to. Um, you're going to need a scatter graph of the data with. PPM on the y axis and voltage on x. Right, so you're making a voltage measurement, you're correlating it to a corresponding uh, concentration in PPM. That is not how I would do that. That is counterintuitive to me. To me, I would say I've got a series of known standards of different concentrations on x. My corresponding voltage is in y. They want you to kind of flip those, right? Um, they're going to want you to do a scatter plot. Once you do that scatter plot, you're going to do a linear least square fit on it, most likely. Uh, that is going to provide what's called a transfer function so that that gets programmed into the calculator or the computer so that when they give a measurement, they can uh, make measurement in millivolts. They can then translate that into parts per million. And that was what you were talking about. <laughs> How am I doing that? So um, they're going to need the equation above the mathematical model. Um, it is probably going to be a linear fit for that. Hopefully it'll be a pretty nice linear fit of the mathematical model used to convert the voltage to this corresponding concentration in PPM highlighted for easy identification. I forgot to highlight, highlight there. Um, a printout of the program with this code highlighted showing this exact mathematical equation. And on the same program printout, highlight the code that will illuminate the LEDs according to the concentration range. So that's the one they're going to have to change on the fly the day of. They're going to be like, oh, which range lights up which LED? But, so uh, we want to be able to see, okay, this is this is what the part is that they're changing. A front cover labeled with the team name and team number for the current tournament. Questions about the design log? Yes, I just based on what I had this spoke. Okay. So for this, it's going to be uh, a high speed submarine detector building. Yes. So we are building. Uh, we're right. building an ORP probe. We have not, there's really three parts to this guy. One is a physical probe or sensor that okay. they're going to make that is going to measure ORP. We'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. That's, I think, going to be the most challenging part for the students. Then there is going to be some sort of microcontroller, either the TI Innovator, an Arduino, something else that is going to do analog to digital conversion, interact with the breadboard to light up the LEDs, right? That's going to be your communication hub. And then you've got the computer or the calculator, which is going to be the brains that will take that reading, that digital reading, and turn it in from millivolts into parts per million, and then tell the microcontroller which LEDs to light up. So you said it's, uh, you're building a probe based on calculator micro microcontrollers. Let me, let me go back a slide or two because there's there's bunches. Yeah. All right. So up here in the upper right hand corner, there's some of them: TI Innovator, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, Microbit. Lots of different microcontrollers out there. Yeah. She used the TI for her group yeah. last time uh, because it's all kind of there and the, you know, the Science Olympiad stuff kind of links to TI. This TI is also sponsoring the event. So um, there's kind of a little bit of cooperation there uh, between okay. them. I see it's kind of pre set up to just be plugged into your TI. Right. So the, the controller libraries for that should be. Pretty straightforward. Um, but that's part of why we don't have one set up today because I can't learn four different programming languages in a month. Yeah. yeah. 
it's okay. We will focus on we will focus on the harder part for the students. Right. So it's going to be like the TI Inspire or the TI. I think there's one for the 84 plus. Yeah. So if you go to TI's website, which we will go to and hopefully <laughs> before the end, or if not, I can show you. Uh, but they've got different libraries and different basically programming languages for each calculator type. Right. Uh, 3D printer, laser cutter, CNC machine, or similar device is used as a tool to build a CNC device, or any component thereof. The following information must also be supplied in the log, such as parts purchase or an end item. As far as do not require this information, so information about the tool is hardware. And basically, we just want to know how did they build it if we have got a 3D part. We well, anticipate people needing to make 3D parts for this. Did you make the 3D part for anything? Yeah. Um, descriptions of how you constructed it. From the tools components. All numerical values should be labeled with standard units, right? So label the units. Don't just have numbers hanging out there, right? If it's 134, we need to know 134 millivolts, 134 parts per million, 134 millimeters. What's that 134? Um, appropriate to the dimension being units. Try to use SI to make our lives a lot easier. All logs will be returned to the teams after inspection. I would say make it copy. Make it copy because I have seen conflicting things as to whether or not it is or it is not going to be returned to you. So make it copy. Right? And since you're doing stuff with the computer anyway, I would just make my log digital from the get go. All right. So we're going to talk about what is this ORP. So ORP measures whether or not a water sample is reducing or oxidizing. Uh, so just like you got a pH scale, anybody blown away by a pH scale? All right, cool. Uh, you also have a ORP scale, so just like something can be acidic or something can be basic, um, a solution can be either reducing or oxidizing. Don't worry, we'll talk about what those are in a second. So some solutions like acid manganate are going to be strongly oxidizing because it strongly attracts electrons from redox electrode. And so the potential is highly positive and something like a sulfite solution would be reducing because it's gonna push electrons into an electrode. So with our pH meter, what are we measuring? We are measuring H plus. Right here, instead of measuring H plus, we're measuring electrons. Right? We're directly measuring electrons rather than protons. This is kind of how a working probe would work. You've actually got two separate electrodes. One is going to be a noble metal electrode, and the other is going to be a reference electrode. It's going to be governed by the Nernst equation right here. So the math that you're going to get when you go through an impurity to determine all of your voltages and measurements and correlate them, it's going to follow this equation. I have a new brain. There's some visual aids. These guys are examples of this working electrode. It's going to be on the left. Those are something that would be very easy to build, right? Um, if you go to Ford Scientific, Ford Scientific has like a kit for Science Olympiad. It has like 15 meters of silver wire in there, plenty of silver wire. And this is a reference electrode. This is the trickier part. And so this reference electrode, and I'll talk about that guy in a second, is going to have a silver wire on the inside, and it's going to have a solution of calcium chloride or silicon chloride or something with chloride in it that is going to provide a stable voltage. So when you make your measurement and you hook it up to a voltmeter, right, one lead goes on here, one lead goes on here, you stick it in the solution and you make a measurement of one relative to the other. Right? So when you get a voltmeter, right, your voltmeter is going to have 
red wire and a black wire. When you're going through and doing this, be consistent with which one gets which connection. Right? If you buy something that is a commercial probe, right, like this gauge meter, right, it's got a BNC connector. You still have two electrodes. It shows that they're packaged a little bit differently. What I think is going to be easier for the TV to do is make two separate electrodes and then just kind of tie them together. All right. So that is the Nernst equation. So something like this is what I anticipate that they would make. They have a reference where you've got your silver wire and some silver chloride, and then just basically something inert with your noble metal surface on the end. So they would have making their way, making their way around. Okay. What is tricky is this part right here. So in our reference electrode, in order for us to have a electrical circuit and to measure that potential, I need to complete an electrical circuit, right? Current has to be low. Right? If I just have this guy in a solid tube, I wouldn't get any readings because I need to, this is my voltmeter up at the top, I need to be charged around in a circle, right? So I need some way for charged particles or ion to move. And you got that little rubbery thing at the end of our about a reference electrode. That's gonna let ions move into and out of that switch, into and out of this electrode. Right? This can be a lot of different things, right? It has to let ions look. This junction could be a porous material, it could be like a little plug. It could be that uh, kind of plastic that's on there. They're going to have a couple of different options. This is also the part that is going to go wrong the most. If they're having problems, it is going to be something with this junction potential. This junction potential, or this junction, as we're going to see in a second, is going to be the same thing as a salt bridge would be in a regular electrochemical cell. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen electric chemistry. Well, let's talk about that. All right, so and that's kind of what they're going to make. Right? Put our attention on that yellow dot. They're going to have a hard time finding something that will act like that porous membrane or will act like a junction. So they're going to make the salt bridge instead. Um, just real quick. Um, they're going to be measuring stuff by not percent by mass, but they're going to measure stuff in PPM. Everybody familiar with different uh, units for concentration? Vaguely, it might have been a while. Okay. Um, you can measure things if you're a chemist, but you can like this one, right, where we're going to say how many molecules of what type per unit volume. Another way to do this is by percent mass or PPM. So what is a PPM? All right. You guys probably already know percent mass or percent by 100. So if I had a sample that was 100 grams of sample and it was 2% gold, you would say how much percent, how many grams of gold is that? Two grams, right? So you're gonna do grams over grams times a 100 to get parts per 100 or percent. If I did grams over grams times a thousand, you would have parts per thousand. If I did grams over grams times 10 to the sixth for one million, I would have parts per million. So grams over grams times 10 to the something. So um, it's just gonna, gonna take us through that little calculation there, right? Percent per thousand per million is times 10 to the sixth. Move that decimal place over. Now, when we look at our EPM, there is a quick and dirty way to calculate that. Uh, and that is if the following two things are true. If one, you've got a dilute solution, that's not a very highly concentrated solution, and B, that solution density is one gram per milliliter, one part per million is one milligram per liter. All right, so if our solution is going to be 
grams of our grams, and we take our grams and we convert them into milliliters, and that march from milliliters over three orders of magnitude into liters. And we take our grams and we march in three orders of magnitude. The other way, three and three is six. That's our understanding. Yeah. Hey, this is just a question. How does this work? Is that a specific game? Because I, I think I remember in chemistry just calling them unit conversion. Yes, it's that, just unit conversion. Okay. All right, so I want you guys to know what a part per million is because one of the things inside towns online did not have that property. Fine. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit tricky. Yeah, part per is grams over grams times 10 to the 6. And then this is just like, like you said, it's quick and dirty. I mean, it'll probably work for them, but you want to make sure that that solution density is one. So if I did this in seawater, where the solution density is in one, 1.2, that will that little trick will not work. All right. So sometimes you will see stuff where the reason we have is taking that shortcut, but oftentimes it works. Like if you're talking about a 10 ppm, 100 ppm. All right, so let's talk about what redox is <laughs> real quick. So you've got two parts between redox and action. One is oxidation and one is reduction. And it's talking about whether or not a given atom or molecule is going to gain or lose an electron. So oxidation is the loss of one or more electrons, and reduction is the gain. That's going to be related to voltage or EMF, which is our ability to move electrons. How much do they want to move? There are two acronyms you can remember. Leo says GER, lose electrons, oxidize, or gain electrons, lose, or oil rig, oxidation, losing, reduction, gaining. I am not smart, so the way I remember it is, number goes down, reduction. Iron three to iron two, number go down, reduction. I'm doing electrolysis water, when I'm going to hydrogen plus one, hydrogen zero, number go down, the hydrogen. The nice thing about electric chemistry is opposite of that. So if I know what is being reduced, the other part of my reaction is where things are getting oxidized. So Leo says GER or oil rig, or number goes down. And so in a chemical reaction, redox reaction, we're always going to have this work together. You're going to have a reduction, you're going to have an oxidation. You can't have one without the other. That loses the reducing agent is oxidized. Oxidation number increases. Reduction, the other reactant gains electrons. So the oxidizing agent is reduced, and the oxidation number decreases. All right, so here we've got zinc metal reacting with H plus. Then you might have done that in lab. I'm going to take some zinc. I'm going to add some acid to it. I'm going to bubble bubble make some hydrogen gas. When we do that, hydrogen is going to plus one to hydrogen zero. All right, the number's gone up. Oh, sorry, number's gone down. Number's gone down, it's been reduced. Our zinc is going from the zinc zero to zinc two plus. In this ion form, the number is going up, it's oxidized. So what your sensor is going to do is it's going to measure the sum of those two reactions. So you've got two half reactions, one with the zinc, and then here we're looking at copper, one with copper over here. That's to give us an overall reaction. So what we can do is we can take our two reactions, right, our overall reaction, split it up into two halves, and physically separate them to make what's called an electrochemical cell. So we're going to have two halves. Right? Now these two halves by themselves right, are not in a circuit unless we have this thing called a salt bridge. The salt bridge is going to allow sodium ions to move toward this positive charge cathode and sulfate ions, in this case, moving towards the anode, which is negative. So, this migration of ions is what completes the circuit, allows charge to move. Right? This salt bridge is doing the same thing as that junction. And a salt bridge it can literally just be. Spring soaked in something like sodium nitrate. That's so how I'm going to do it in lab. I'm going to take two little beakers. See if you got compounds you like to set one up. Take these materials. Oh, 
come out of these strings, you can clean them. There's the sodium nitrate or something else. When, when you're having your students do this, whatever is in this salt fridge is going to matter. Right? So if we're working with something like a silver electrode, right, we do not want to have like chloride as the salt in there. Not just any salt is going to do. So you might want to talk to whoever you're doing chemistry over at your school and make sure you've got access to something that will not cause a precipitation reaction to happen. Right? Because what are you measuring? You're going to be measuring chloride. If you are making your salt bridge with chloride, you're putting extra stuff that you're trying to measure into your solution. Right? So just because it says salt doesn't mean it's table salt. Yeah. So just in context, how does this relate to our, our, our building of the pro? So how would this be? All right. So we did you miss this part? Yeah. So with our ORP pro is what we call a combination electrode. If you go buy one, it's really cheaper than one. Okay. And I've got two electrodes. One is a working electrode. Yeah. Which is just a piece of metal. Um, I would probably make it like this if I were them, because this is going to be easy to clean and polish. Okay. As opposed to this one. Which has probably more surface area, but it's going to be really hard for them to clean. And if this thing starts to get gunky or gutty, got to rebuild it, right? This guy can be polished, right? And then a reference electrode. This reference electrode, so this metal bit makes direct contact with the solution you're measuring. This reference electrode is going to provide a stable half reaction, but if I just put these two things into a solution, right? This guy's making contact with my liquid, but this guy has to too. And it's got to do it through this salt bridge. Right? And on here, I've got this nice little membrane material. That'll work. Probably not going to have that. Right? Ions have to flow between one electron and another. Charge has to move, otherwise, I don't have an electrical circuit. Can't measure my potential. So I'm going to have to have a salt bridge, and that could be something as simple as a piece of string. Soaked in ammonium nitrate. That connects both of them. So that connects and allows that. Yes, exactly. You need both. Right. So, so theoretically, I'm going to have to build a road. They have a picture of the road. So you have to build a road. They have a picture of the road. In theory, yeah. It's just your original market. And there's a hundred billion dollars. I mean, you can do things, and you can probably look online how to do that. And oops, a little bit um, on the on the rules clarification, one of the things was, do I have to have a salt bridge? And the answer was yes. Which, like, okay. And does the salt bridge have? Can the salt bridge contain metal? I'm like, oh, that doesn't make sense. But I mean, you could probably use something or. There are ways to do that and allow the ions to move. Um, if you uh, go to like a like a bioelectrochemistry demo kit, oftentimes we'll have ones that have a plastic cup, and you put one solution on the plastic cup, and then you got a ceramic cup with a different solution and a different electrode inside of it, but kind of stack one inside the other. And that ceramic is porous, and so that acts like the Salt bridge water, that's going to provide your junction. The disadvantage of the advantage of having something like that membrane is that it's a lot more mechanically stable. Right? Kids sit things in string and then putting it on there, so much variability. Um, like, okay, I made one, is it going to give me the same voltage reading as something else? The disadvantage of having a membrane is that. It's probably going to be slower to respond because the ions have to move around. They have to just on a piece of string, and they're like, uh, I kind of want to go anyway. So it's going to be a little bit, I think, tricky for them to do it as a membrane. And the rules say salt bridge, so I would think so. But go ahead. And so the piece that goes into the copper, mm -hmm. is, what is the name of that? The, the, the yeah. piece that goes into the yeah. solution. Yes. Um, so we would have something like this, or it'll be hurt. Yes. And you would have two electrodes. Okay. The one that's a reference electrode. So if I was building this, I would have uh, 
I would have this one is easy, right? This is just I've got a piece of silver, silver wire. Take it in there. I would try to like maybe put it in a straw, fill it up with hot glue or something, so I got a nice stable surface. I'm not reacting all along the length of the silver. Just have that one surface. Then I've got my reference micro, right? Ions need to go between, so in my solution, right, they have this, um, and then I would probably do it where there is another bigger tube. Like so. My metal electrode in there, which would go up to my voltmeter, right, and then literally a piece of string kind of hanging on the outside. Okay. And then my yeah, other right and my other electrode over here. Got it. That's it. Piece of string hanging off the side. You know, you could probably fancy that up a little bit, put the string inside of like a uh, like a poppy stir stick. All right, to just give it some mechanical stability so that it's not just like hanging out there the entire time. That would mean that you only got one point of contact if you needed to refresh that surface, pull a little bit, put it in a snippy snip. Refresh it that way. Conceptually, it's not how we have like in relation to the build. It's not the hardest build, but it's not the hardest build. <laughs> it takes a second to understand, and I think it's going to be tricky when they go to try to build it. And the tricky part is really going to be that salt ridge. That's the big variable. The silver wire sitting in a PCL solution, that's easy. Right, I can take the silver wire and fill up one of those plastic or one of those plastic tubes with some uh, KCL solution. I'll get a nice stable half reaction on one half. It's that part where the two have to talk to each other. That's the salt bridge, and I, that's going to give them the most trouble. All right, so if I take two, if I take a copper electrode and a silver electrode, and I put them in a uh, solution of copper sulfate and silver nitrate, nothing interesting is going to happen. Um, if I take those two and I separate them, where I've got my copper in one side and my silver on the other side, still nothing happens because I don't have a circuit. I need to add that salt bridge to complete the circuit and to provide ions for charge balance. All right. That potential that you're going to develop is controlled by the Nernst equation. Let's talk about the Nernst equation for a second. It's going to say that the voltage I develop, E cell, is going to be related to the standard state cell potential. So there is basically a reference value that you have for each half reaction. You add them up. That's going to be your starting point. And then you're going to adjust that potential a little bit based on a couple of factors. R, that's just our ideal gas constant. P, that's the temperature. N is the number of electrons that are being moved around, F is Faraday's constant, and log of Q. Right? Log of Q is going to be products over reactants. One thing is getting oxidized, one thing is getting reduced. That's our concentration term. All right, so this log part is going to be where our concentration is going to reverse back out of. When you're doing just conductivity, it's pretty straightforward, it's nice and linear. This time we're going to get something that's going to be loggy. Yeah, it's not hard because the computer and the calculator is going to be able to handle log this out pretty nicely, right? And, it, and this is going to, how is this actually going to be connected to the, the calculator? All right, so you're going to have basically a little electrical lead. Yeah. If there's two wires, one's going to be attached to this electrode. We want to leave that attached to our reference electrode. Those wires are going to lead to that microcontroller. Okay. So micro microcontroller to the goal to the V that you had labeled in the previous equation. Right. So I've got a whole meter in my ones where it's just reading this voltage. Right. The PI innovator board is a little module that connects to the calculator. So it'll be the part that goes in between the calculator and the probe. That will be the voltage measurements. That's also going to then control the other things. Okay. Yeah, the download is going to be going to deal with the download code for the innovator. Yes. Reads. Yes. But it's pretty straightforward, right? I haven't done it until. That was easy. No, it's doable. It's doable. If 
we could get a word to the point. That's about what I could say. Yes, the hub, the TI Innovator Hub. That's going to do your analog to digital conversion. That's the one that's actually going to read that voltage and then pass that on to the, the calculator, which will do the math. So you have to program. You got to program. Well, the calculator will program the yeah. hub. And then from the calculator, it'll upload that to the to the. Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you knew you'd be a kid that. Yeah. If it was me, I would have the kid who's really good in chemistry lab working with the kid who's really good at computer science. I'd have one of each. Because that's a lot to ask one or to, to ask somebody to be good at both, it's hard. Yeah. I would have one who's kind of a computer expert and one who's kind of a chemistry expert. And so the overall goal of this is who wins. Who wins? <laughs> Who's going to be the closest? So a lot of it is that log. I think a third of the score is that log. Um, and then another good chunk of it is the test. And then how close are you to whatever the value is of the solutions? So there's some performance aspect in there. The about half. Um, how close are you to the actual reading? If it's a thousand ppm and you've got a thousand dead on, yeah, equal points. If it's a thousand and you read five hundred, there's some formula that tells me what that what that number of points is. And then there's something for did you write light up the correct LED at the right time? Okay, that's what it is. I, I was thinking what it could look like if it would be a relationship between how many LEDs you could light up. No, that would be that would have been a logical easy way to do it and a way you could implement that purely in hardware or analog, but they really want to have both a programming part and an instrumentation part. There's really they, they want both. Yes. Yes, there's a lot of engineering in this one and not just Yes, they have to engineer part of it. So, is there a test test part of it? Yes, there will be a test test part. What is the test? Um, the test test part is going to be over. Um, there are ones that are online that you can go to. You go to uh, soinc.org and you go to the event page. There should be some old exams from previous. Um, well, the computer programming and engineering part will be pretty similar. The parts that are going to ask about the measurement will be different because it's going to be more electrochemistry rather than how do I make a temperature sensor. So there, like, there might be some questions. Right. Yeah. What is the purpose of the salt bridge would be a very good question. Yes, why would I not want to use a sodium chloride salt bridge, right? If I'm measuring chloride ions. Um, this is just another schematic of that. Where we've got this reference electrode over here, which we're making with ACL and AG, and then over here into our sensing or indicator or working electrode, which is just that in the wire, which Probably want to encase or something. And then we got that salt bridge that connects them, but here it's just showing it as half of this reference electrodes. So that would be where that don't happen. Right? That's where I've got the membrane on the end of this guy to allow those ions to touch. That's where we're making the connection. And, and this any engineer will tell you anytime you've got a point of connection, that's a place where something can break or go wrong, right? So um, I, I am predicting the salt bridge to be the main problem. Huh? So we got a solution that is going to be analyzed. Our reference electrode should be nice and stable um, in potentiometry. One end of the salt bridge and the indicator electrode are given to the solution that is to be analyzed. So you don't actually have to have the this part in your probe. You could just have the salt bridge coming down 
That's just a different way to design that if you wanted to. Um, it's like the little lecture that I have, it's kind of like, I got, I got a whole lecture, put the whole thing in. But I guess you could have like your stable chloride solution somehow top and then just the salt bridge coming down in. I haven't really thought about that. Um, so, but just one end of the salt bridge from the indicator electrode and your reference, or sorry, one end of the reference electrode and the salt bridge in the solution you're testing, and then the inert indicator electrode in the solution. All right, so this is a HEHCL reference electrode. The half reaction itself is going to generate about uh, uh, 0.199 volts. So when we make our reading, it's already got 0.119 volts on a reference side, and that'll be nice and stable. And the reason why that's nice and stable is that in our solution of silver and silver chloride, right, so we're going to have some uh, KCL solution in here. On the surface of this wire, we're going to build up a solid AGCL, solid AGCL specific. So if I had the No. Yes, that is one reason why you don't want to. That's part of it. Part of it is because you're measuring for um, Part of it is because if you've got silver wire, you are going to build up this specific thing. You're going to build up this film on it, which is good for the reference electrode because you don't want things to change in the reference electrode. On your testing electrode, right, you do want things to change. So that's why you're going to want to make sure that that working electrode is going to be nice and polished and has a clean surface. So they're doing this experiment over and over again. They're sticking that silver into a chloride solution. They're going to start to build up silver right on the surface, and your sensor won't be as sensitive, right? which is why I think this design, the thing at the end, polish it, is going to be better than this one. Where they just have a wire because they're going to have to polish that wire. I guess the shorter wire, the better. Well, it's not so much that it's shorter, it's that it's a nice flat surface okay. that they can polish. All right. Yeah. I mean, you could probably do the same thing by taking that wire and like making a little spiral and then smooching that out and then embedding it in like hot glue or something. Yeah, or something similar to this, except maybe it would just be like big air. I mean, like, you know, like you would go down like this. Like, you know, you know, like maybe. But, but then that's going to be in part of their design. How are they going to build that? Yeah. The what? Like if you were at a school. Oh. There's no way to build it. Like, you know, I don't know. I'd have to check. But you wouldn't get nothing. Yeah, you get score for what you did. So, yeah, we can tell you. We get to do that before you guys come back. Just plenty of the beginning.
measuring a metal cation. So you see how it's following that Nernst equation. It's whatever my basic standard state production potential is, adjusted by something related to the log of a concentration. So if we're measuring a metal, that's going to be the thing that is going to be uh, reduced. And then the thing that's going to be the top. So if we're looking at a metal cation, so if I wanted to measure silver, I would use that. Not measuring silver, we're going to measure chloride. It's a little trickier. And so this is just an example of that. If we're using SCE as a reference, um, we're we would be using the AGCL reference to be like point one nine nine. Is that just to paint that number in there? Minus, oh sorry, this is our, uh, that's a reference, so it would be 0.199 in there. So this would be the thing that we actually measured, right? Or, or, or our measured versus the, the standard reduction potential. And so we can get a P function just like we get pH, kind of how pH works. So uh, if we're using SEE or we're using the AGCL reference, that is the other half reaction. So our total measured voltage is going to be are indicated minus our SE. Now, when they go and they do this, my guess is they're probably just going to get a series of voltage measurements, and because that reference is going to be the same each time, they can just do this empirically, and they really have to worry about what actually is the voltage of the reference. Because they already know it. If one, they already know it should be, it should be 0.199. Um, but because they're just going to collect, they're going to collect data. And they're going to plot stuff on X, and they're going to plot stuff on Y, and they're going to get a mathematical curve out of that. So they kind of don't have to measure. Um, this P function here, this is just like pH, which means minus base time log. So this P is correcting for the log part. Yeah, so what does it look like? This is just uh, the equation. If we're going to go the other way. Well, I can hang up for whatever questions they want to ask. So I wanted to do this one because this is also going to be relevant to what they're going to do. Um, so if you have a simple metal electrode, this is basically what they're making. Um, so we're going to sense CO minus with a silver electrode, which is probably what they're going to be measuring rather than actually ORP. Because ORP would be measuring the reduction or oxidation potential. This chloride by itself, CO minus, is not oxidizing. Chlorine gas would be oxidizing. And hopefully they're not making chlorine gas. Hopefully, get that battery up high enough. Maybe they are. So this is my suspicion as to what they're actually going to be doing, where on the surface of that electrode, they're going to be forming. So this is my reaction between silver chloride dissociating into its ions. It doesn't want to do that. It's a non-spontaneous reaction. It wants to go the other way. Where it takes silver and chlorine and I mix them together and I form a precipitate. We're looking at this non spontaneous reaction. We're going to take an electron, break this guy up into easy solid and scale minus. And so, we're kind of measuring the inverse of what we want to happen. Just here is the math that goes with that. Again, what are they going to do practically if they do that? If you said they're going to make a series of measurements to come up with a function. This is just the chemistry that I suspect they're really going to be doing with that. Um, 
As far as that probe design goes, uh, like I said, the salt bridge is going to be really important. Um, if I were to take those two things and on a regular electric chemical cell and just kind of put them together, uh, and then rather than have it separate, I can take one of my beakers and put it inside the other beaker and hang my salt bridge off the side. I think what you're going to be doing, right? Where the salt bridge in contact with the solution. This test electrode, this is similar to how a battery would be, except in a battery, a piece of paper is going to act as a salt bridge. Rather than just having one little thing, you can have this paper wrapper on the inside of the storage barrier. Right. Practice run. I don't think we're going to have time for that. Um, things you should know. Um, you should probably know about what a voltage divider is, uh, just in case. Uh, we probably won't have to know about Van Hoff factor uh, because we're not necessarily doing conductivity, but uh, let's get that up. Here's up on the written test. Uh, electrolysis in this person's So if they're providing power and putting power into their probe, they don't think they have to. Um, they might end up, they might do it on accident. They might decide, okay, I'm going to have a probe program might tell it to send a voltage down the wire. But uh, just in case, it could be doing some unintended electrolysis. Um, conversion between analog reading and voltage. How are we going to do that? How does that microprocessor work in taking uh, analog measurements in millivolts and giving them a number that a computer can read? Uh, the relationship between different units, PPM, molarity. How do LEDs work? Um, how are you going to calibrate that to that mathematical function? Um, working with raw data and determining the real world relationship. Why would you want to do this in the real world? What's an ORP measure? Where would you find one? And operation knowledge of the basic device components. So it's kind of like quiz questions. Yes. Yeah. That would be like the quiz questions. Um, let's see, some of the questions they asked updated. Uh, to ORP, is it still an ORP? Yes, it has to be an ORP probe. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll put these online for you guys too. That's just where I stole that from. Is the reference? Yes, it has to be an ORP probe. Um, in terms of building that, they may need to on their board have a resistor in between where their leads are coming out of. So on that uh, microcontroller, you might need to do some resistance measurements or amplification. Um, not all resistors are going to be good. So this is just the past STEM product projects. If you inspire, this is one from the PI site. So uh, just some of the observations was that in their materials and tools, it was 1K ohm resistor. You may need a different resistor. Um, in here, if you're looking at lower concentrations, you might end up causing a little bit of electrolysis if you're putting things in at really high potentials. All right. Um, I said think like a blockhead, think about things modularly, right? Have somebody work on the probe, try to troubleshoot that. Have somebody work on the code, try to troubleshoot that. Don't try to do things all together all at once. It's a really big project. Right? Uh, do a high level, how do we a high level overview? Like, here is my computer, here is my microcontroller, here is my probe, here is my LED breadboard, the LED LED. So, think about it in different blocks. I think it's going to help them take what is a really big piece of pie and make it into a little bit more bite sized bits. Um, helpful resources, uh, just so that you know that they're there. Uh, obviously, all the Science Olympiad stuff. Here is one that they just say does not work. A lot of the stuff on Science Olympiad that directs you, and the GI site itself directs you to this, does not work. Right? That website does not work. Um, there are links to the GI thing that do work. Um, this is uh, a good reference for uh, how all ORP conductivity change uh, works. Uh, these are resources to help prepare uh, both from TI and Vernier. 
Um, there was a let's chat from last time. Um, this just is going to give you some of the components that are allowed. So, uh, breadboard, either kind of pre made or port boards, your screen, your mic, your controller, those are all good. Not allowed would be something like a another pre built board or really big batteries or a pre made ORP or or reference electrode. Um, the rules clarification said you cannot buy a salt bridge. Um, are we allowed to purchase a salt bridge and an electrode in order to combine them, or do we also have to construct a salt bridge? And it says that they have to be constructed in order to build that salt bridge. ACL, but you can't do it pre assembled. And then last, I think, was this one, which was Will a salt bridge containing a metal be considered a salt bridge? We already talked about don't be sodium chloride in your salt bridge, and acid and silver. Um, and I don't know what they mean in the question by containing the metal, because if it's solid metal, it's not a salt, and it will work to maintain charge balance on the salt bridge. And most of the ionic compounds would technically have no cation unless it's ammonium. And then I do not use ammonium nitrate, so that's going to affect the pH of your solution. And that pH is then going to affect your ORP rating. Um, I do not know if a semi force tension material is acceptable or not. So maybe, maybe not. I would try to make it with just a piece of string or a piece of paper. Because you've got to maintain the charge balance. So as you are putting electrons onto, say, uh, we got a like copper, we got a copper silver cell. Yeah. Right? And we're putting electrons onto the silver, right? Those electrons have to come from somewhere, right? And they're coming from the copper half reaction. But when I do that, I'm depleting. The electrons on my copper side. I'm getting extra electrons on my silver side. And if I let that happen, I'm going to build up plus charge and negative charges. I can't have that. So the I've got to have electro electrolytes coming out of the salt bridge to maintain the charge balance. So I would have had Ag plus in solution. That Ag plus becomes Ag solid. Well, now I've unbalanced my charges. Plus charge is going to come out of the salt bridge and into that silver side. On the copper side, where I'm building up, taking copper solid and making Ag plus, I'm going to be building up a bunch of Ag, a bunch of copper pluses. To maintain that balance, I'm going to have to have an ion come out of the salt bridge and cancel those charges out. Yeah, we're more subtle. Right, it's what not like we use all a metal ones. because everything. Because a metal, like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to. I can't do it because one side's got to produce cations and one side's got to produce anions to, to balance it out. And if it's, if it's, if it's like a metal, like iron, uh, I'm only going to go one way. Okay, so that makes sense. And the string is just to slow things down. To the that. string is just there to hold those ions. Um, you can hold those ions in uh, agar or jelly, like you can take some jello, make yourself some salty jello, and uh, you know, use that instead. And it'll blood the salty jello. Um, it could be a cotton ball soaked in your electrolyte solution, but you basically have to have some sort of electrolyte being contained in a material that will allow the component ions to move. Okay. So even in your example, you're saying we did a cotton ball on one side and put it in the other. No, so the cotton ball would act like the salt bridge. Okay, so the cotton ball is going to be uh, the junction. It's going to be where, like down here at the bottom. Right? So down here at the bottom, you would have that little cotton ball. That's where some ions can go up into the reference and some ions can go down into the solution. It's going to maintain that circuit. Is it really a bridge or is this stuff just coming from the solution? It is. Really it, bridge, like, do they actually travel from one yeah, to the other? Wait, this is my, this ions just can migrate, and that is a, that's a thing. Um, where what the ions in that salt, what the salt is in the salt bridge will matter, and you can measure like the 
does sodium move faster than acid? Yes. Like, is it just coming out of the it is or is coming out of the being pulled out of the like it's pulling out of the um, yes, I, I guess. Yep. So some ions are going into the string from your sleep, and some are coming out of the string into your sleep. It seems like the name, like if you're thinking like the like LMA, like are they traveling from the sleep? Like, is the is the string just providing the ions and collecting the ions? Like, is it actually getting from the ions? No, uh, the, whatever the ions are in your two half cells for your half reaction, they won't go anywhere. Um, it's the ions in the salt ridge. You know, you might get some that are trying to make their way over, but they're it's not. not that's, 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 that's a supply. That's a supply. If you think of it as a supply of cations, a supply of anions that will allow charge. So, as far as charge goes, it is a bridge. Charges are moving. As far as physical ions are going, you. So, I think for the most part, I understand everything. In fact, yes, it is, it is really, really right. tricky. By all means, feel free to hit me up. Uh, my email, if you've got that in our little email database thing. So, this is a challenging assignment for a lot of resellers. Uh, yeah. uh, why they decided to go with an ORP probe, that was part of my, like, oh, oh my. Because if I just wanted to measure sodium chloride concentration, I would do that with a conductivity probe, or I'm just going to put two wires in and supply a voltage and then measure the resistance. Right, that's much easier to implement than this. <laughs> this is hard. This is really, really hard. And there's so many things where students can, you know, get things wrong or things can over time degrade. But right? yeah. how they did it for like got two wires. But they get bent or crossed, and you know, but that's obviously the same. Degradation of that salt bridge, where if your salt bridge isn't wet and it's dried out, it's word. If your electrode surface isn't clean, it's not going to work. There's so many other places I think for instrumental errors creep in or build errors creep in. And then you got to figure out the programming on top of that too. Yeah. It might be one of those those groups that specific group will excel in. So, yeah, they, somebody they might spend really, 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 really well. Because it's so confusing. So, like, it's one group is going to focus everything. Yeah, on I, I think if you've done it before, yeah, like you guys have, yeah. you pretty much already have everything apart from right. You're going to need to change your equation yeah. from a yeah. linear equation to we know how a long equation. equation. I mean, we just we just took forever to get this, to get the breakboard working with the lights on. I mean, just from, just to actually get the circuit to go. I mean, that was yeah, it's, it's not a trivial. Last time it was a scale. Oh, yeah, it was a scale. Oh, yeah, they had a mass balance. The mass well, balance, they had in my temperature probe. <laughs> they had a mass balance scale. Yeah. Oh, they had a mass balance scale. They had a uh, temperature probe. And they had a right. salinity sensor. So those are the three that I've planted. Right. That, that's it. That's it. But, yeah. Yeah, that's. This one is by far the hardest because they have to make the most and right. the trickiest to make. You know, either buy a strain gauge and then just take that or the temperature one they just hooked up to a thermistor. And it's like, okay, that was that, that was a hard thing. We used to have the reason off of that. But this one is trickier because you got to use that chemistry in it as well. But from what I'm seeing through the ranch, make sure that we are going to take a test and we're going to yeah. try to get the LEDs to line up. And then the other category. Is that we're doing the math out of the calculation to uh, yeah, right. and yeah, the average to figure stop on the voltage. Right. And that's going to be a log type of relationship rather than a linear relationship. It's cool, it's cool. But oh, it's neat, but it is a lot of work, especially right. This would be a oh, this if I were to do this in college, this would be like a three or four class. Yeah. And and that is, would be two, three weeks of just getting the the prototype so This is really, really high level stuff. So I, I, I appreciate the effort that those kids are going to put in in advance. Yeah, I think that's the Well, I didn't know how challenging it was going to be until I started reading and had to revise all my stuff. All right. I will see you guys. The outfits we have so many of the past two buildings too. 
scientific field as a result of this case. Okay, I just got I I got an, an email, a text from a parent a couple of days ago whose son is at the University of Alabama and on his program. And she said he's trying to do some um, program in Croatia 